Let me begin with a question this morning and ask, what are the fears of your life? What are those things in your lives that you fear most? What are those things that so often bring you to the boundaries of life, that bring you to your knees before God? What are those fears in your lives? The Gallup organization uh, asked 13 to 17-year-olds what they were most afraid of. And we could do this with, with our group and, and see, you know, how uh, online we are. But in descending order, the, the top ten fears of these teens at that time uh, were, first of all, at the top ten, ten level, terrorist attacks. The one underneath that uh, took, I think, quite a switch. Uh, spiders was second. <laughs> terrorist attacks and then Spiders. Uh, death and being killed was next. Not succeeding in life, being a failure was next. Followed by war, heights, crime slash violence. And the top three, third was being alone. The second was fear of the future. And the number one was fear of nuclear war. Interesting. What are you afraid of this morning? We have no shortage of fear in this life. We have many fears in this life. And yet if God is good and loving, and we know that He is, and if God is all-powerful, and again, we know that He is, and if God has a purpose and a plan for His children, as we know He does, and if we are His children, which I hope we are, then there is no reason to fear anything, for God is in control of everything. So to overcome the fears of our lives, we have to see life as God sees life. We have to begin to see our fears as God sees our fears. From the book of 2 Kings, we read that the king of Aram was at war against Israel, but the king of Aram had a very uh, sizable disadvantage because every time that the king of Aram wanted to take on something against the nation of Israel... The prophet Elisha was given a word from God, and Elisha would take that word, he would speak that word to the king of Israel, and Israel always knew what Aram was going to pull next, so they always were prepared for what was taking place. So the king of Aram decided that the only way to deal with that is to first get rid of the prophet. So I don't know why he thought he could attack the prophet, and the prophet wouldn't know that he was coming since he'd been telling everything about the nation. But nonetheless, the king of Aram sent his night troops to surround Elisha and his city during the night. And in the morning, when Elisha's servant first got up and looked out over the, the walls of the city, he saw that the army of the Arameans had completely surrounded their city. Chariots, horses, fighting men surrounding their city. And Elisha's servant went to him and, and in quite a, a dramatic form poured out his heart to, to Elisha. And Elisha said, don't worry about that. Uh, he said, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed for his servant, and as Elisha prayed for his servant, he prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he can see. And as the Lord opened the servant's eyes, the servant could begin to see, and he saw that this small army of the Arameans was surrounded by the army of the Lord, by the horses and the chariots of fire, we're told, 
that God had sent to surround the enemy army that day. Not a shot was fired. God brought blindness to the Arameans. They were defeated. They were taken as subjects. And then they were treated well. They were given grace, which is another message for another day. The army of the Lord that surrounded the army of the enemy. So what do you see? So what do you see as you look out from your life this morning? Do you see the army of the enemy with the horses and the chariots that have surrounded your life, that have hemmed you in, that threaten your life? Or, or do you see the Lord's army, the army full of horses and chariots of fire surrounding the army of the enemy of your life? Which do you see? To overcome the fears of our lives, we have to see life as God sees life. And we have to see our fears as God sees our fears. Now from the promised land accounts of Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14, and I invite you to turn to those chapters, and also then to put a finger or a piece of paper in also at Deuteronomy chapter 1. Those are the areas where we find the promised land accounts taking place. And from those chapters of Scripture, we find that fear leads us to doubt what God is telling us. Fear leads us to doubt what God is telling us. So when we know the will of God... When we know the will of God, we need to do the will of God. We need to do the will of God immediately. We learn from Deuteronomy chapter 1 that God has given his people the land, the promised land. God has given that land to his people. And that God had commanded them not just invited them, not, not asked them, but that God had commanded them to go up and to take possession of the land. This is the land I'm giving you. Go in, take it. It's yours. I gave it to you. But God's word, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, God's word says, Then as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Oreb, and went toward the hill country of the Amorites through all that vast and dreadful wilderness that you have seen. And so we reached Kadesh Barnea. And then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See then, the Lord your God has given you the land. He's given you the land. So go up and, and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, told you to do. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go up and take the land. I have given it to you. Now, sometimes we're waiting on the Lord, and when we're waiting on the Lord, we're discerning what the Lord would have us to do, or we might be seeking what it is that the Lord would have us, where he would have us to go. But the people of God who had reached Kadesh Barnea knew the will of God without a doubt. The will of God wasn't in question. They knew the will of God. God had made his will clear and they knew exactly what they were supposed to do. This wasn't a time of discernment anymore. Those, those times had already passed. This was a time when God was moving. They knew what God wanted. They saw God moving, and it was decision time. God has said, let's go, and the people said, uh, let's not. Let's not. The cloud of God's presence was leading into the promised land, but the people chose to remain behind in the wilderness without God. Now, when we read Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, 
it seems like it was God's idea to send some spies out into the land of Canaan before going in to take the land. It sounds that way. Beginning with verse 1, Numbers 13 says, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. And from each ancestral tribe, which is 12, send one of its leaders. So you have your 12 spies. But for those of you who are old enough to know Paul Harvey, Paul Harvey used to say, now for the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is found in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22. Now, the Lord had just made his will clear to the people of God, including Moses. The Lord has just said, go up and take possession of the land. Take possession of the land as the Lord our God, the God of your ancestors, told you to do. Go up and take it. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. And then Moses tells us what really happened. Moses says, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Then all of you came to me and said, Let us send some men ahead to spy out the land for us and to bring back a report about the route we're to take and the towns we'll come to. In other words, let's go in and check it out. And, and the idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12 of you and one man from each tribe. So God said, let's go. I've given you this land. It's yours. Walk in and take it. And the people said, let's think about this a little bit. Let's think this over a little bit. I'm not sure that, that we can do this. Maybe we, we, we should strategize a little bit. Let's go in and explore the land first. Let's go in and size up this place. Maybe we really can't take this place after all. And this was their first act of disobedience that led to all the others. Their first act of disobedience it led to all the others. So we find that spying out the land wasn't God's initial will. His will was to go in and take the land which he was giving to his people, which was theirs for the taking. God was saying, you don't need to go in and check it out. I've already checked it out. I've given this land to you. I'm sovereign, I know, so just go in and take it. But because the people were walking in disobedience... God allowed them to follow their own plan, a plan which said, eh, you know, let's, let's see first. Let's check this out for ourselves. And their first act of disobedience led to their second act of disobedience, led to their third act of disobedience, and finally led to their deaths. Fear leads us to doubt what God is telling us. So when God tells us something and we know the will of God, we need to do the will of God and we need to do the will of God immediately. Don't need to check it out. We don't need to do this or that or, or study it some more or talk about it some more. We just need to do the will of God when we know the will of God. So what is it that God has given you to do? What has God been speaking to you about? What is it that God has spoken to us as North Clinton? Where is it that God is calling us to go? What's the word of God that you're hearing? You see, we need to do the will of God immediately. We need to focus then on the promises of God. What has God promised to us? You see, fear leads us to dwell on our own problems. Fear leads us to dwell on our own problems instead of focusing on God. So when we know the will of God, and that's the key, when we know the will of God, we need to focus on the promises of God. Kadesh Barnea is a place of decision. It's a place where we either follow God or we turn away from God. It's a place where we either act on the promises of God or a time to trust in ourselves. It's either a time for faith or it's a time for doubts. And again, we need to emphasize that these people knew the will of God. They knew the will of God. 
They knew exactly what they were supposed to do. They knew precisely what God had spoken to them. And with the written word of God and with the Holy Spirit revealing Christ to us through the word of God, we most often know the will of God as well. And when we know the will of God, we're right there with the people of God at Kadesh Barnea. And when we're at Kadesh Barnea, God is moving and God is saying, let's go. No more time for decision making, no more time for discerning. It's time to move. Let's go. Now from Numbers chapter 13, beginning with verse 27, the spies come back and they bring this report. They said, we went into that land which you sent us. And it does flow with milk and honey, like you said, and here's the fruit. But the people, the people who live there, they're powerful people, and, and the cities are fortified, and, and those cities are very large. Why, we even saw descendants of Anak there. And the Amalekites, they live in the Dejev, and, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, they live in the, in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. This place is, is filled with warriors. And then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up, and we should take possession of the land, and we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone with him said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. We can't do it. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there are of great size. Why, we saw the Nephilim there, and they're the descendants of Anak, the he seemed like grasshoppers. He seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and, and we looked the same to them. God had promised to give them the land. God said, this is your land. Go take it. I'm giving it to you. It's yours. But they were acting as if the battle and the fight belonged to them. You see, they were focused on all of their problems, which, which made their problems bigger than life and ultimately made their problems bigger than God. Where is it that God is moving this morning in your life? Where is it that God wants to take you? Where is it that God wants to take North Clinton? God is moving. And when God moves, we need to move with God. When we know the will of God, we need to focus on the promises of God, and then we need to remember and give thanks for how God has led us in the past. You see, fear. Fear leads us to despair of all that God has shown us. So when we know the will of God, we need to remember and give thanks for how God has led us in the past. You know, fear makes us forget everything we've known. When we're fearful, it's like we can't quite remember how good God has been and how God brought us through here and here and here and here and all these things that we should know. Fear makes us forget everything we've known. Ten of the twelve spies came back and said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. Why, it would be foolish to go in there. Numbers 14, verses 1 through 4 then. And that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. Hmm. If only we had died in Egypt. Or even in this wilderness. I mean, 
Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword here? Why our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Go back away from God. Go back into captivity. Go back into everything that God didn't want for us. We should go back. Now, let's again be reminded that these people knew the will of God. They knew what God was asking them to do, and and these people knew what God could do. Not only did they know what God was asking them to do, but they could see the visual presence of God while they were saying these things. If you remember, the Israelites weren't out there in the wilderness by themselves. As they left Egypt, God's presence was there in the form of a cloud in the daylight. And at nighttime, he appeared as a pillar of fire. And if you remember the way the Israelites were told to encamp around that tent of meeting where God's presence was at, There were three tribes on each of four sides, so all the people of God had equal opportunity to see the presence of God at any point in the day or night. There was God's presence. And we know that that they didn't set out from camp unless God moved. And, And if God stayed there for a week, they stayed there for a week. And if he stayed there for three months, they stayed there for three months. But if he stayed there just overnight and next morning, they got up and they moved. To do anything less was to be left behind in the wilderness without God. So they followed the presence of God. When they come to Kadesh Barnea, there is God's presence. The presence of God, the same God who was with them throughout all of the wilderness journey. The same God who had held back the Egyptians by that cloud. They couldn't see them. The same God that led them on through the wilderness. They saw the glory of God every day of their lives, and they still said they couldn't go where God was leading them. Yesterday they could. The day before that they could. But today we can't. They saw the glory of God every day of their lives. And speaking to Moses, the Lord said that these people had seen his glory, had seen the signs that he had performed, verse 22 of chapter 14, and yet had disobeyed and tested him ten times. They witnessed the plagues in Egypt. They experienced the crossing of the Red Sea. They saw water pour forth from a lot. From a rock in the desert, they six days out of the seven collected manna that fell from heaven, which they ate as heavenly food for that duration of time. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. They saw the presence of God in the cloud and in the pillar of fire. They saw how Moses came back from the tent of meeting with his face with the Shekinah glory of God. What more could they ask of God? How could God grow their trust any deeper? What more did these people need? You know, we ask these questions of the people standing at Kadesh Barnea. But we have to ask ourselves the same questions as we stand at the Kadesh Barneas of our lives. Fear leads us to despair of all God has shown us. So when we know the will of God, when we know what God wants, when we know where God is directing, we need to remember and give thanks for how God has led us in the past. And as we remember and give thanks, we need to repent of anything that keeps us from God. Fear leads us 
to distance ourselves from God. It began in the garden. It's still happening today. Fear leads us to distance ourselves from God. God who is our only hope. So when we know the will of God, we need to repent of anything that keeps us from God. When the people wept over their supposed inability to take the promised land, when the people began to show contempt for the Lord and say, why did the Lord bring us out here to die? Then we read the words of Scripture from Numbers chapter 14, beginning with verse 5. We read that Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly who were gathered there, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephuna, who were among those who had explored the land. They tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and He will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their, their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. And then, then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. And the Lord said to Moses, how long? How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs I have performed among them, how long, Moses? Where is it this morning that we are living in disobedience to the Lord? Where is it that we have failed to Make Him Lord of our lives. Or is it that we are refusing to believe what God is saying to us? You see, when we know the will of God, when we know what God has asked of us, when we know that the Lord is moving, we need to be on our faces in repentance with Moses and Aaron. We need to repent of anything that stands in our way of following where God wants to take us. And then finally, when we know the will of God, we need to stay on mission with God, taking others with us into the promised land. Because fear not only destroys our own hope, but it destroys the hope of those around us. Because fear leads us to dash the hope of others around us. So when we know the will of God, we need to stay on mission with God, taking others with us into the promised land. You see, ten men, ten men spread a bad report. I've seen it happen in churches. Ten men spread a bad report. Ten men chose to disbelieve God. Ten men said that what God was asking couldn't be done. And they led a whole nation. They led a whole nation away from God. They should have been remembered as leaders who took God at His word, as leaders who led their people into the promised land. They should have been remembered as leaders who moved as God moved. But instead, they were driven back into the wilderness where they saw the people under their leadership die every day as a result of a decision that they had made at Kadesh Barnea. And after seeing all the others die, then they died. We need to stay on mission with God, taking others with us into the promised land. The promised land beyond Kadesh Barnea was a physical, a geographical land that, that God wanted to give to His people. But the decisions we make, 
the decisions we make that influence the lives of those around us involves a promised land that is eternal in the forever kingdom of God. And the way we respond to God may well determine whether someone spends an eternity with God or an eternity without God. For eight decades of the 20th century, Christians in Russia experienced persecution from the communist government. And I know that as we are worshiping freely here today, there are the persecuted church, people being martyred for their faith around the world, being persecuted. It was during that time that Dimitri, a man by the name of Dimitri, began to tell his Bible stories and verses to his own family because the only churches in Russia at that time were government churches and they were a three-mile walk away and they were four hours away from Moscow where he lived. So he began to teach his own family the Bible stories and, and they memorized Bible verses and soon it caught on and the neighbors got word and, and the group there in Dimitri's house grew to 25. And when it grew to 25, the authorities came and warned him to stop teaching. And he refused. The group soon reached 50 people. And when the group reached 50 people, Dimitri was dismissed from his factory job. His wife lost her teaching position and his boys were expelled from school. And yet he taught. And as often happens with the persecuted church, it grew to 75. And at 75, the authorities came and, and beat him publicly in front of the church and, and warned him never to teach in this name again. And he refused to stop. And the fear of God spread and 150 people came to the very next teaching that Dimitri gave. And the authorities came and they took Dimitri to prison. And he was tried and he was found guilty and he was given 17 years for teaching the Word of God. He was the only known believer among 1,500 prisoners in that prison in Russia. The officials tortured him, the prisoners mocked him, but he never broke. Every morning he would stand by his bed and he would raise his arms and he would sing words of praise to God as the other prisoners up and down the corridors jeered and mocked him for his praise. This went on for 17 years. 17 years in those conditions. The officials beat him, threatened to execute him, and he still worshipped. Finally, the authorities had had enough. Finally, the authorities said, Dimitri, either you recant or it's your life. And because he wouldn't recant, recant they, they dragged Dimitri out of his cell and they drug him down the corridor in the center of the prison where all the prisoners could watch him being drug away and taken to execution. And as those authorities drug Dimitri down the corridor, 1,500 criminals raised their hands and began to sing the song of praise that they heard Dimitri sing every morning. And the jailers were taken aback and they just kind of stopped and looked at Dimitri and they said, Who are you? Who are you? 
And Dimitri said, I am a son, a son of the living God. And his name is Jesus. And they took him back to his cell. And they soon released him to return to his family. The way we respond to God may well determine whether someone spends their eternity with God or in separation from God. As we stand at the Kadesh Barnea's of our lives, may we be given the eyes to see as the Lord sees. And may we be given hearts that beat with the Lord's boldness. And may we have the faith to follow wherever the Lord leads us. And the Lord said, go up and take the land. I've given you the land. It's yours. It's a gift. It's the gift of promise. Take it. You're my heirs. Go. Go up and take possession of the land as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, told you. And don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. And the people of God at North Clinton said, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And they went up and they took possession of the land, claiming their community for Jesus Christ. And may it be so. And may it be so. And may it be so. Amen. Would you stand with us as we finish up this morning?
peace with us. He will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Satan has been defeated. His only ploy is to make us feel defeated. giving you 